Oops. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Titans of Texas, SMU, and TCU. Really excited to uh, ha have these two schools with us tonight. Uh, first things first, a little bit of uh, housekeeping issues. We have a couple of handouts. Um, if you look in the go to webinar control panel and click on the handouts tab, you should see two handouts. It's just shameless marketing. So grab them if you want them. Uh, if you don't see them, send me an email, jason at scoreatt.com, and I'd happily email them to you. If you have any audio difficulties at all during the course of the uh, webinar, if you click on the audio tab, there is an option to call in by phone. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally we do have this problem, and that's the quickest and easiest way to fix it. Before we introduce our two uh, panelists tonight, just wanted to run a quick couple of polls. So let me bring the first one up, see who you are. I'm only gonna leave it open for about 30 seconds. Um, so if you guys can just key in your answers. Great, we got over 50%, over 60% have voted so far. 75% has voted, 78, 81, 84. This is filling up fast. We're at 91, 94. God, we could get to 100. This might be the first time we get to 100 this early. Looks like we're going to stop at 97%. Good enough. Uh, just so everyone's aware, uh, right now it looks like we have mostly educational consultants um, at 68% and 26% of rising seniors. Uh, and just to get an idea of where you are in the country, same thing, I'm just going to leave it open for about 30 seconds. All right, let's see. We're getting there, 88, 94, 97. I'm going to stop it at, oh, at 100%, look at that. And just so everyone knows, it's a pretty, this is the, the most even distribution I've ever had uh, for one of these polls. So that's really interesting. Okay, a little bit about our presenters. First up, we're gonna have Joe Davis from SMU. Um, Joe went to SMU. He graduated from SMU with a bachelor's in financial consulting and a master's in accounting. Um, and he now works at SMU. So he just basically never left. Uh, and a fun fact, he is married to a TCU graduate. So this should be really fun. Hopefully he and Heath will be very friendly tonight. <laughs> also with us is Heath. Einstein uh, from TCU. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, Heath. Uh, he's a native Californian in his ninth year at TCU, having spent the prior eight years as a college counselor at an independent school in New York and Texas. Before that, Heath worked in admissions officer at his alma mater, the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., who was with us last week. Uh, we went. Uh, he went on to earn a master's in public policy from Georgetown. Uh, Heath's obsession with the study of presidential politics date back dates back to the early 1980s. Heath has held numerous board positions for Texas Association for College Admissions Counseling, served as the uh, TACAC delegate to the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, and was a, ma a member of NACAC's Government Relations Committee. TACAC recently honored him with its Founders Award for service to the profession when he's not watching or Cybermedically analyzing his favorite sports teams, he can be found at home with his wife of 14 years, Diana, their three children, uh, Levin, Adele, and Asher, and their toddler cat, Ruby. Finally, our host is my mother, Judy Rabinovitz, uh, who is a certified educational planner uh, has been, and has been guiding students for over 35 years. As an educational consultant, she authored numerous books, articles, and software on test prep and college planning. In her 23-year tenure at Educational Testing Services, she was te the technical liaison to the college board. She wrote the college board's first SAT prep software and strategy chapters of their original SAT prep books. Judy found the score at the top uh, in South Florida, which is accredited by Advanced Ed Incognia. Her five locations provide academic tutoring, SAT and ACT prep, courses or credit, and a full-time private school in an intentionally small classrooms of one to six students, which is also fully virtual. Uh, Judy achieved a perfect score on the SAT and has devoted her professional life to helping students achieve academic success. Um, so now I am going to turn this over to Joe to give his presentation and we'll go from there. 
go, Joe. All right. I think that is looking correct for all of you guys. And if that is not, just let us know in the chat and I'll get my, my screens cleaned up and let you you're see what you're saying. Perfect. Um, as uh, Jason said, my name is Joe Davis. I'm the Associate Dean of Admission here at SMU in Dallas, and it's great to be able to talk with everybody this afternoon, give a little bit more information about the university, help you understand, um, um, if, for those of you who are students, if this might be a good fit for you, and for those of you who are our counselors, help you find students within within your um, cohorts that might be, might be finding a home at SMU. Um, uh, we are located in Dallas, Texas, about five minutes north of downtown. So um, what I would consider a suburban campus in an, in an urban city. And so we have the benefits of being close to a major city. But at the same time, when you're on campus, you don't feel like you're in the middle of, of a downtown area. So it's really the best of both worlds in that sense. And I think that 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 balance is something that that carries over through a lot of the things that we'll talk about as we as we look at the university. Um, we have about a total enrollment of just over um, um, 11,000 students, closer to 12,000 students. That includes our graduate population. We've got about 6,700 undergraduates. So really right there in the middle of, of, of a mid-sized university. Um, average class size about 22. Um, about a third of our students, um, about 30% of our students are students of color. So students coming from all over the country, all around the world as well. Um, when you look at our breakdown, that's one thing that makes SMU a little bit different from a lot of the schools in Texas is that we get about almost 60% of our students from out of state. So bringing in students from all 50 states, from over 90 different countries, so a wide range of students from a wide range of backgrounds going in a lot of different directions. Um, when you look at um, our students, they tend to be interested in a wide variety of areas, multi-interested, multidisciplinary. Many of our students um, pursue multiple degrees. The curriculum has been designed so that students um, have the flexibility to pursue their interest and, and aren't limited by, by the structure of the university and the structure of the curriculum. So we really focus on, on empowering our students to be able to pursue their passions and and seek out the, the opportunities they're looking for um, across the disciplines at the university. We have over 100 different majors. Um, the university is structured with, with five colleges granting undergraduate degrees. I'll, I'll touch on each of them in, in a little bit of detail. Um, the largest school at the university is our Dedman College of Humanities and Sciences. That's all of the traditional humanities programs in English and history and political science but also, of course, our natural science programs in biology and chemistry, um, as well as math and physics and, and statistics and all of those areas. Also, some more unique interdisciplinary programs, things like human rights and public policy, health and society, uh, very strong programs there. Again, many students in Dedman find themselves double majoring, either within the college or across the different schools at the university. Um, a lot of flexibility to be able to pursue undergraduate research, be able to work closely with our faculty, build those mentorship pairings that, that you carry on, not just in your four years on campus, but, but into your careers beyond the university, whether you're going on to graduate work, um, medical school, law school, or, or on to a PhD, whether you're going into the workforce at graduation or, or, or doing something else. So we have a lot of students that, that do move on to graduate study, um, either in pre-professional areas or um, going into a research track as well. So a, a very flexible curriculum that enables students to really really hone their own path and, and, and march out from there. Um, Dedman would be our most, our most wide ranging program. The other four schools are going to be much more focused in their particular area of study. Um, the Lyle School at the university is our school of engineering. Lyle is um, a very strong engineering school with um, 17 different ways to specialize in engineering degree at the university, so a very flexible engineering curriculum. Civil, mechanical, environmental engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, computer engineering, and then specializations in things like structural manufacturing, bioinformatics, video game development and design. So a full wide range of engineering curriculum at the university. Um, what makes our engineers unique is that 
they aren't your stereotypical engineers. They they are focused on leadership. They are focused on on business careers. Almost as many of our engineers find themselves going into consulting as they graduate as going into a traditional engineering career. So they've learned how to solve problems. They've learned how to analyze situations, and they use that in a consulting career. And so it's it's really interesting to see where our engineers end up. We also have a very high percentage of our engineering students who are female, which is something we're really proud of. Over a third of our engineers are, are, are women. And so that's something that we're very proud of as well to see that our uh, the diversity within our engineering school is, is gender as well as socioeconomic, as well as, as students of color. So a very wide range of students coming in pursuing engineering at the university. The Simmons School is our School of Education and Human Development. Um, Simmons is the smallest of our undergraduate programs. Many of the programs they offer are, are focused at the graduate level, but within the undergraduate program, we have students who are obviously studying to be teachers, but also within the human development program, all of our applied physiology, sport management, um, sports performance leadership programs, those programs are done within the Simmons School here at the university. All of our student teaching is done here within Dallas Independent School District, and so you get real teaching experience. We have students who will do their student teaching as part of their undergraduate experience, or we have students who will graduate in four years and then do their student teaching the following semester as a, as a post-grad as well. So a very flexible curriculum that's really designed to, um, to meet students where they are and, and help them prepare for, for their careers as educators. The Meadows School of the Arts at SMU is um, all of our, obviously, our performing arts programs, dance, music, and theater, but it also houses all of our communication arts programs, so advertising, journalism, corporate communications, public affairs, uh, fashion media, art history, all of those programs are within the art school as well. At SMU, all of our performing arts programs are dual admit programs, so you will apply to the university, be admitted to the university, but you will also either submit a portfolio or submit an audition to the art school. So dance, music, theater, art, and film, those programs all require a yes, both from the admission office and a yes from the major before you would be able to pursue those degrees at the university. It's a conservative, conservatory style program. So um, you're taking uh, up to almost two thirds of your coursework at the university within the art school if you were in one of those performing arts programs. So you can still double major or minor if you want to, and that's a very flexible curriculum, but you can also really immerse yourself within that program and study at a level that you would see at a Juilliard or an Eastman or a um, Belmont or something like that, while at the same time being in the context of a much larger liberal arts university. So you're able to get that true college experience outside the classroom while getting a conservatory style education in the classroom. So a really nice balance there within Meadows. The Cox School of Business is the last of our five undergraduate schools, arguably our most well-known nationally. Um, um, definitely a very strong program, but you know, I would also say that we have strong programs across the board. It's just Cox tends to be in the news and the rankings a little bit more. A lot of that's focused on their very strong MBA program and being in a city like Dallas, known for business, obviously those opportunities are really, really strong. But the undergraduate program at the business school is, is very strong as well. It is a direct admission program within the business school at SMU. So students, when they apply to the university, if they indicate they're interested in business, they are automatically considered for direct admission to the business school. Um, a student can apply for admission as an upper class student, but that's a limited process. As an underclassman, as, a, as an applicant, you're, you're automatically considered. And if you're admitted to the business school, then you move directly in and you're able to begin taking business classes your first semester at the university. Um, so we're, we're strong program in business, finance, accounting, marketing, management, like you would expect to see at any strong business school but also degrees in financial consulting, real estate management, insurance and risk management. So a very wide range of business programs for our students to pursue. Um, you know, that, that's a whirlwind of, of the academic programs at the university of what's offered. Um, as I say, we really encourage our students to pursue multiple areas and to be able to pursue their passions across the different colleges and not see those 
college boundaries as barriers to study, but as opportunities to to go across those disciplines and across the different colleges at the university to study in a, in a wide range of areas. Um, but what goes on in the classroom is only a part of the experience at the university. And so we really want to bridge that classroom experience with what's going on with our students living on campus. So our student, our student housing experience is, is built around our residential commons model. So all of our um, students, when they're admitted to the university, when they decide to enroll, they're assigned to one of our 11 different residential commons. And those commons are, um, students are living in those commons required for their first two years and optional as juniors and seniors. And so you move into that commons as a small microcosm of the greater SMU community. And so in that space, you're able to connect with students from all different backgrounds, from all different um, majors, going in lots of different directions at different places in their journey along their SMU experience. But they're able to share in that commonality and be able to connect together within that commons community and build those lifelong friendships that really build on that. We also have faculty who live in all of our residential commons. So those faculty mentors within the commons bridge that space between the classroom experience and what's going on outside the classroom to create that university experience we want all of our students to be able to experience. So those faculty mentors and those faculty and residents are a huge benefit to all of our students as they live on campus. Outside the classroom, there's so many different things going on with over 200 organizations, Division I athletics, club sports, intramural sports, Greek life, um, various different organizations to be a part of. So certainly what's going on on campus is a, is a huge opportunity for all of our students to take advantage of that, of that traditional college experience um, and, and definitely not feel limited in terms of what's going on outside the classroom. And a huge part of that, of course, is the city of Dallas. You know, DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth is the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country now. It's, it's behind only New York, LA, and Chicago. So the opportunities in DFW are something that you're just not going to see in a small college town of, of 15 or 20,000 people. So the benefits of being in this type of an, an environment in terms of internships, in terms of mentorships, in terms of just student life and experience that's going on outside the classroom are certainly something that attracts students from, from all across the country and around the world to SMU. And we really, we really benefit from that partnership with the city. And so the opportunities that the city provides our students, as well as the ways we're able to give back to the community and engage in community service and, and really be an active participant in, in the life of the city, give our students some really great opportunities there. So that's really just a whirlwind of the university itself. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about our application process and, and what we look for and, and how we approach that as well and, and give you some insight into, into how that process works. And then I'll turn it over to, to Heath to talk a little bit about um, TCU as well. Um, at SMU, we're, we're pretty straightforward with our process. We have two application deadlines, November 1st and January 15th. Um, with both of those deadlines, you get full consideration for all of our scholarship programs. Both deadlines have a binding and a non-binding option. So we have early decision one, early decision two, early action, and regular decision. So you can apply in November or you can apply in January, and you can apply binding or non-binding in both deadlines. We accept four different application methods. We have our own SMU application as well as Common App, Apply Texas, My Coalition. Most of our students are using the Common Application, and so I always tell students, whatever is most convenient to you, we don't want you to feel like you are pressured to use any particular application whatsoever. It's whatever is most convenient to you, most convenient to your college counselor. That's the application that's going to make the most sense. Uh, we want to make that as easy as possible as you go through the process. Um, a little bit of information about the admitted class for this last year. When you look at our you know, GPA, ACT, SAT scores, what we saw when we're looking at an application, um, keep in mind that, you know, that the middle 50% of students that were admitted for each class, so 25% of the students we admitted were scoring below those ranges, 25% of the students who we were admitting were scoring below those ranges. Um, for the upcoming year, given all of the changes that are going on, given the limited opportunities in terms of testing, we've waived our SAT and ACT requirements. We are test optional for, for students applying for fall 2021. We've always been test optional for a number of years for our students in the performing arts and for um, 
as well as international students, but now we've expanded that out for all of our domestic students as well. And so in doing that, we really just focus on all of those other factors in the application as well, looking at the high school curriculum, the essay, the resume, GPA, recommendation letters, all of those factors play a role both in our determination of admission decisions as well as our determination of, of scholarship awards. And, and that scholarship process is really central to, to what we're doing as we go through this process. Um, we're really committed to making sure that any student who's admitted to the university has the ability to be on campus regardless of their financial situation. Um, so we want to reward students who have excelled academically while also working with all of our students who have significant financial need to make sure that SMU can be a reality for them and their families. So we work very closely with our Office of Financial Aid who makes those awards and works with our students in that process. And we want to make sure that we're able to come out with a very competitive offer to, to make SMU a reality for, for our students. And that's something we're very proud of in the way that we do that. Um, there's some contact information. If you're looking to connect with us, get some more information, I would love to hear from you, be able to um, get more information to you about SMU. But um, I know we'll probably have some questions in a little while, and I'm, I'm happy to answer those as well. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Jason and, and, and go from there. Thanks a lot, Joe. Heath, I'm sending it over to you now. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Okay, just want to make sure that we're all safe and practicing uh, social distancing uh, in uh, the COVID era. Hope everyone is doing all right out there. Um, thanks for joining me. Jason, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, you're all set. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, it, it's really a pleasure to be with everyone um, uh, to, tonight. Um, and this is actually, I don't know, Joe, if you know this, this is the second uh, of my presentations today with SMU uh, as a co-conspirator. So, uh, so happy to do this. Um, I've been, my name is Heath Einstein. I'm Dean of Admission at TCU. And I am beginning my ninth year, as amazing as that seems to me, um, here at the university. And I wanted to, before I begin uh, sharing some slides and information about why I think uh, TCU is so great is to tell you a little bit about how I got here because my path is a little bit unusual. You heard Jason uh, outline it a little bit. Uh, for many years, I served as a counselor at a couple of different independent schools. And in that role, I had a chance to visit lots and lots of colleges. Um, and so over the years, I counted it up. I've been to over 200 different different colleges. And my experience when I visited TCU for the first time was unlike any other school that I had been to. And I remember quite vividly driving onto campus and seeing the street signs that were in purple and everyone I encountered here was just so happy to be here. And that really struck me. And I thought, well, geez, as I'm, as I'm thinking about um, helping students uh, helping to guide them through this process. If, if we're going to be asking students to spend the kind of money that, that colleges charge these days, especially private universities, they ought to be really happy with their experience. And true enough, the TCU students are genuinely just thrilled to the point when you walk down the street here, people will very frequently be throwing up the go frog sign. And, um, and if you were to ask someone, just stop someone on the corner and say, hey, can you can you point me to the library? You know, at most schools, people are genuinely pretty friendly and they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. At TCU, what you'll find is people will actually stop what they're doing and escort you to wherever it is on campus you wanna go. And, uh, and that's not an apocryphal story. That happens routinely here. It says a lot about the students we're able to attract, but I think what it said, speaks more to is the culture of the environment that we have here on campus. So we're very much defined by uh, this idea that, that students come here because they want to be leaders in their field, but they also want to be part of a supportive and caring uh, environment, one that's going to sort of nurture their interests um, and, uh, and cultivate a sense of, of community. Uh, I like to start with the mission of TCU because I think that's a big part of who we are. We're a mission-driven place. So you can, you, I don't need to read the words to you that are, that are on the screen, but we talk a lot about these ideas of ethical leadership and responsible citizenship. 
not just in an information session like this, but when students come to campus, they can anticipate that they're going to be having conversations with faculty members in the classroom, with resident assistants in their residence halls, and all across this campus about what it means to be an ethical leader, what it means to be a responsible citizen in the global community. One of the very first questions that we're asked is, what does the C in TCU mean? Um, we are Texas Christian University, um, but I think we're a little bit different from other religiously affiliated institutions uh, in that uh, we are at our core a liberal arts and sciences uh, uh, college. Um, we're not a Bible school. And what that means is uh, we have a historic relationship with the Christian church disciples of Christ, but there's no expectation that students who come here are necessarily practicing that particular Protestant denomination, or for that matter, any denomination. If you come to TCU and you're a person for whom faith is really important, you're gonna find a lot of fellowship here. But if you're a person who's sort of still on your spiritual journey, you're gonna be absolutely fine at TCU and nobody's going to be telling you what you need to believe. This isn't a, a didactic place where, where when you're in the classroom, you're, uh, you're expected to uh, adhere to certain religious doctrine. Um, I can speak as somebody who's not Christian that I feel extremely comfortable at TCU and have never once felt like someone is trying to get me to believe something that, that uh, goes against sort of my own core principles. So you can see here 60 plus faith communities that are represented on campus. There certainly is a wonderful chapel on campus that is used quite frequently, um, but chapel attendance isn't required. So it's really an individual choice. Every student is required to take one class in a religious tradition that is part of our core curriculum. But what that tradition is, again, is up to the student. So if you're a person who has been a practicing Christian your entire life, for example, and you'd like to come here and learn about Christianity in a more academic way, you could certainly take a course in that. Or you might say, you know what, I have a really good firm understanding. I'd like to learn about Caribbean religions or Eastern religions or any other any any uh, number of other classes, and that would satisfy our religious traditions requirement as well. Um, we are a medium-sized institution by just about any definition. We have 9,400 plus undergraduate students. What is different about TCU than any other school a student could be looking at is that we are the only school that plays in a major Division I conference athletically where the emphasis is almost exclusively on the undergraduate experience, okay? So there are other schools that play in one of the Power Five D1 conferences, and, and they may be, you know, again, similar in size, but they have way more grad students than we have. We only have about 1,500 graduate students. And so in that sense, what is distinguishing between TCU and every other school is you're getting the kind of attention that you would typically see at a small liberal arts college in a more geographically isolated area, but you're not at one of those places. You're in the middle of uh, a, a major city on a beautiful residential campus, and, and Joe um, already described the, a little bit the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, and all of the resources that you would have at a larger school. So we feel like we've carved out really the best of both worlds uh, in that respect. This is a really active, really active student body. So I mentioned before how friendly it is. One of the things we're looking for, and I'm, I'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the admission requirements. One of the things we're looking for is evidence that a student has been active in their, um, in the, during their high school years, uh, because we have a really active community. And one of the best ways we can assess if a student is likely to remain active in college is how, how active they've been during high school. So when you come here, you're gonna have the opportunity to participate in uh, hundreds of clubs and activities, um, everything from uh, athletics, either at the intercollegiate level or intramural or club level, um, to multicultural student organizations and service organizations. Um, service is a huge part of the experience. Um, so it's very unlikely you're going to run into students who go to class and then come back to their residence hall and spend the rest of their, their days there. Um, on the contrary, a lot of large group activities that occur, um, traditions that are just, just wonderful and things that, that students look forward to every year, like our annual tree lighting ceremony, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving break. Um, we have something called the common table, where there is literally a one long table set up at the, in the middle of campus commons where everyone gets to break bread together. Um, it's a way to, to build community. So lots of ways that our students engage with one another in really meaningful ways and as a result are able to build 
uh, relationships that go far beyond four years that, uh, that happened here at TCU. I wanna briefly describe the various academic opportunities that exist on our campus. But I think what you need to start with is that we are um, at our core, a liberal arts and sciences institution. And we were founded way back in 1873 as that. Um, and so while we have incredible pre-professional programs that I'll go into in a minute, what's important to understand is that no matter what the student's major is, the student must complete our core curriculum. And that represents about a third of the coursework. That includes even our conservatory style uh, performing arts programs. Um, even those students will have about a, a third of their programs in the, the liberal arts and sciences. Um, Another third typically is made up of your major, and then the remaining third, um, again, with the exception of, of some programs, is going to be completely up to the student. And that's why many students will choose to double major or pick up a minor or, or what have you. And, and, and in that elective space, students can choose anything from uh, classes like beef cattle production, I mean, who doesn't want to take that, um, to uh, from, from Bach to Rock. Um, and everything in between. So lots of choices. And, and, you know, this is where whenever I flip through the course catalog, I say flip, I don't do that anymore because nothing's printed on paper. But whenever I uh, virtually flip through the course catalog, I get really jealous of students um, because they get to, you know, map out um, some really, some really interesting classes that go beyond what they plan to do uh, professionally. Um, we have eight different uh, colleges at TCU at the undergraduate level. And this is in uh, no particular order. Um, the Neely School of Business, we're consistently ranked as having one of the top 25 undergraduate business programs in America. Um, the DFW area is home to close to two dozen Fortune 500 companies, as well as thousands of other places of employment where our, um, our Neely students are getting um, incredible uh, pre-professional experience um, that will often turn into uh, job offers after college um, and really high paying job offers after college as well, both in the DFW area and if students choose to go somewhere outside the region, um, we have a strong network of alumni that will help students uh, uh, transition into those parts of the country as well. I mentioned uh, the, the foundation here at TCU in the liberal arts, and indeed we have the Adran College of Liberal Arts, and that is home to the widest number and greatest variety of majors on campus, which is why if a student coming into TCU isn't sure exactly what they want to study, and they come in as what we call pre-major, because that sounds a little more impressive to mom and dad than a undecided, um, they would be in our Adran College of Liberal Arts. Um, because you're going to be taking a lot of uh, liberal arts courses anyway as part of the core curriculum, that's a good place to start. And then you'll work with an academic advisor to see, do I indeed want to pursue a major in Adran, whether that's political science or history or, um, or modern language, or do I want to um, maybe fork off into one of the other colleges at the university? Our College of Science and Engineering is home to arguably our strongest students. If you look at it just by the numbers, grades and test scores, um, the, the science and engineering programs are just outstanding. We have uh, one of the premier pre-med programs uh, in the entire nation. About 80% of our students who go through pre-med or what we call our pre-health professions institute are being uh, admitted to med school, which is about twice the national average. And, uh, and the Austin American Statesman, which is a newspaper down in, uh, in, in the capital, Austin, Texas, has stated that TCU has the best pre-med program in the state of Texas which on its face is impressive. And then when you consider that there's a very large flagship institution right there in their backyard is made even more impressive that they would say that uh, about TCU. Incidentally, TCU joined forces with the University of North Texas Health Science Center to launch a medical school last year. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for students to do internship, uh, internships or research right here on campus um, in our College of Science and Engineering and uh, alongside uh, medical students as well. Our engineering program uh, is relatively small. That's by design. We want students to be able to work really closely with faculty and, and in uh, group efforts. Every student will complete a senior design program where we have an outside company come in and give students a project and they're given a sum of money. And at the end of the project, they've got a set of deliverables that they can now show to prospective employers that they you know, sort of prove they can do uh, professional level work. And, uh, and as a result, those students are getting hired into, into the top engineering firms in the country. Our Harris College of Nursing and Health Sciences is home to uh, the most competitive program at TCU. That's our nursing program. 
Um, I think what distinguishes nursing at TCU is it's a direct entry program. It is a program that exists ex exclusively on this campus as opposed to some other colleges where to pursue nursing, you're, you're, you're having to go to a different uh, part of your community or, or, or a satellite campus. Um, students are guaranteed to get that clinical rotation or, or internship experience by the end of their sophomore year. And you get to wear purple scrubs and everybody loves purple scrubs. Uh, we have our Bob Schieffer College of Communication, named after Bob Schieffer, who's a 1959 alumnus of TCU. You might, rec might recognize the name because for years he hosted Face the Nation on CBS News. He is a frequent guest on campus, um, giving very freely of his time to our students, which is, which is quite lovely. Um, it's home to communication studies, journalism, strategic communication, which is uh, sort of a fancy way of saying advertising and, and public relations. And, and, uh, and other programs as well. Um, we have really unparalleled facilities when it comes to communication. And because we're in the number four media market in the country, our students are able to get internships with local news affiliates like WFAA, which is our local ABC affiliate or ESPN radio or any number of other outlets um, that our students take advantage of. And we also have our own publications on campus that are run completely by uh, by students. We even have our own public relations firm called Roxo, where not necessarily large companies, but smaller companies that don't have the budget to hire um, big PR firms are, at, are actually hiring our students to do their, their uh, advertising and PR work. We have a college of education at TCU, and our students are able to get experience in the classroom without even having to leave campus, because we have two lab schools at TCU. We're the only college in America that has two lab schools on our campus. And if you're not familiar with that term, a lab school is a fully functioning educational entity that serves as a laboratory for the college it's associated with. We have two, one is called Kinder Frogs and one is called Star Point School. And they're primarily for students who have learning differences or other developmental disabilities. And it's a great way for our students to get into the classroom as early as their first year at TCU. Our students will also necessarily graduate with an internship with the Fort Worth ISD. So our students will graduate um, almost always with two pre-professional pre experiences. We have our College of Fine Arts, which is home to BFA programs in musical theater, theater, dance, um, and, uh, and, and music, and several other arts programs, uh, graphic design, fashion merchandising, uh, interior design, et cetera. Um, we were the first college in America to offer ballet as a major. That surprises some people, but I think it really illustrates the point uh, about how illustrious our program is. Um, onstageblog.com has rated our musical theater program the number six program in the country. I'm not a huge fan of rankings, uh, except for when they make us look good. So I'll, I'll cite a few along the way. That's one of them. Um, and our musical th theater program is truly um, extraordinary. And then finally, our School of Inter Interdisciplinary Studies, which is home to our program in women and gender studies, um, as well as, as comparative race and ethnic studies. Um, it's one of our newest schools on campus, but quickly growing in popularity, especially as, um, as we see events take shape around us in, in society. Uh, we have our John V. Roach Honors College. So students who are applying to TCU have the opportunity as well to simultaneously apply to our Honors College. And if you are enrolled in the Honors College, you are enrolled in one of our other degree uh, programs at the same time. The advantage of an honors college is classes tend to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more discussion based, um, but this is a this is a cohort program. So you're actually living with these students in Milton Daniel Hall, which is one of the um, which is one of the loveliest residence halls on our campus. Um, if students are not able to gain entry into the honors college as an incoming student after your first semester at TCU, if you have a 3.5 GPA, you're eligible at that point to uh, to join the honors college. The idea isn't that it's more difficult or challenging necessarily. We're not adding on to. It's really you're taking honors classes in place of one of the other classes that you'd be taking in a given given semester, and you you will have the opportunity through honors to to complete um, uh, a, a special project uh, before a thesis or, or seek um, university honors by the time you graduate and have a special ceremony. Okay, I do wanna talk a little bit about our admission process. Our application will open up 
um, here on August 1st. So we're putting the finishing touches on, on that. It's uh, incredible. Just as we finish one cycle, we move right into the next cycle. Um, we have two different deadline dates. One is November 1st, the other is February 1st. November 1st offers both early action, which is non-binding, and early decision, which is binding. So for students who say TCU is absolutely my first choice, I can't imagine going anywhere else, then November 1 early decision is a great way to go, and we'll let you know again uh, by, by January 1st. Um, but we really only encourage students to do that if they know this is where they want to be. We're, we're not one of those schools that's trying to push ED um, uh, very hard because we know that students sometimes feel pressured into making that choice because they're trying to game the system. For us, we're, we just want students um, to make that decision if genuinely this is where they want to be. Um, like SMU, we offer four different application platforms, um, our own application, Common App Coalition, and Apply Texas, which is uh, sort of our state's version of uh, of a common application for the 85% of the people on the call who are not from the state of Texas and aren't aware of Apply Texas. Um, but it matters not to us which of those application platforms you choose. And I think that's an important point to drive home because a lot of students feel like, well, if you're offering your own application, don't you really want to see your application? And the answer is no. We want to see the application that's going to allow students to put their best foot forward. If that happens to be Apply Texas or the common application or the coalition, by all means, you should you should um, use one of those. The other thing is we have custom questions on those other application platforms that essentially mirror what we're offering on our own application anyway. So truly, it doesn't matter to us. Once you submit that application, we have, um, as many selective colleges do, uh, we, we employ a holistic review process, meaning we're looking at everything that you submit to us. The vast majority of the decision will rest on the student's academic preparation. And we, we define academics rather loosely because like SMU, we also have moved to a test optional environment for the entering fall 21 class. So if you submit test scores, that will be part of the review of your academics. Um, but if a student chooses not to submit test, test scores, they're not gonna be harmed at all, either in the review for admission or review for academic scholarship. What we wanna see is students who are prepared to succeed here, because we could think that a student is an incredible person, but if we are concerned that they're not gonna be able to do well in the classroom, then all that other stuff doesn't really matter, and the student isn't gonna gain admission because it doesn't, it doesn't really help the student or help the university to admit under those conditions. Once the student has established they can do well, in the classroom, that's when we really start to focus on the other elements of the application. So I mentioned earlier that we've got an extremely active campus and that we're looking at a student's co-curricular accomplishments when we're trying to um, assess their likelihood to, to thrive outside the classroom at TCU. I'm really careful to not to say um, co-curriculars at your school because there are a lot of students um, who have chosen to pursue activities that are outside their school community and that's absolutely fine. There are many students who frankly need to work to help their families make ends meet and don't have the time to, um, to be involved in five or seven clubs on their campus and that's okay too. We really want to get as holistic an understanding of the student as possible. So to the degree that a student is willing to share the um, who they are, we want to see that. It's one of the reasons why we offer students the opportunity to submit what we call the freedom of expression. So you don't see that here because it is an optional item, but as part of the application, you'll see we have, and we have for decades, offered this freedom of expression. That's for students who feel like the traditional application doesn't capture everything about them that they would like for us to know. So if you look, if you were to look around my office, which you don't have access to right now, but I'm, as I'm staring around, I have submissions of, of freedoms of expression that students have sent in over the years. Some of the more traditional freedoms of expression would be an additional uh, writing sample, maybe some poetry. Some students will send us a link um, to original music composition that they've constructed. Other students are even more creative than they'll, they'll send in physical items to us. Um, all of that is great. None of it's going to make up for a, a lack of uh, proficiency academically, but it does add texture to a student and in our understanding of the student. So that's really important. We also require an essay, um, as many schools do, and uh, one teacher recommendation and a counsel, counsel recommendation. 
Um, you can see here what the, typically a successful student is in our process. This will give you a sense of, you know, if a student is going to be competitive for admission. Obviously, scores and grades above those marks don't guarantee admission and below don't, don't guarantee that a student wouldn't be admitted, but just gives you a sense of where you ought to be, at least if you want to um, feel like you've got a, a good shot of being admitted to TCU. Understand that we're not trying to keep people out. One of the things I love about TCU is while we're selective by definition, um, we're admitting almost half of the students who apply for the, to the university. So I like to describe TCU as a selective but accessible place. Um, if students aren't admitted, we do offer the ability to transfer um, as long as you've done at least 12 credits, so about a semester at another institution, either a two-year or four-year institution, and have established that you can handle college-level work, we will invite um, hundreds of transfer students to campus each fall semester. Okay, so what does it cost to get to TCU or to be at TCU? We're not the uh, least expensive school in the country. We certainly uh, recognize that. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that we're not even among the top 100 most expensive colleges in the United States, if you can believe that. Um, that doesn't really help if you think that $66,600 is a lot of money, and it is. The good news is we offer a lot of academic scholarships, everything from our founder scholarship, which this past year was $12,000, all the way up to the chancellor scholarship, which is full tuition for, um, for our top academic students. We will interview students for the chancellor scholarship. There's a special chancellor scholars weekend in February. Um, we will invite about 140 students to campus to vie for that scholarship and about 50 or 60 will be awarded that each year. But even if you're not awarded that full scholarship, there's still ample dollar, dollars to be earned through our competitive academic scholarship uh, program. And then of course we have need-based financial aid. We require FAFSA or TASFA, um, which is a, a, the Texas version of that, uh, FAFSA um, and the CSS financial aid profile. And most students at TCU, the vast majority of students are on some form of financial assistance. So we really do have a wide range of students here in terms of their ability to pay. And we don't want students to be discouraged from applying for admission just because they don't have $66,000 lying around for each of the next four years. Um, so then what happens once you're here, how do you get out of here and what happens then? Um, TCU is, a, is one of those places that is really focused on students preparing for life outside of the university. So um, you can see that students are, are, are quite successful both in landing internships when they're, when they're uh, pursuing their, their degrees here at TCU, but then also after college um, securing those jobs. Um, I, I like to point out the bottom left part of the screen where, where it shows what we call our internship scholarship program. So what that is is money that the university has designated to students to pursue unpaid internships. So oftentimes students will um, during the during the summer, for example, be uh, able to secure an internship that's going to help advance their career, but it's offered as an unpaid internship. Um, and we don't want students to be forced into making a really difficult choice. Do I work at the local movie theater so I can earn some dollars to spend during the upcoming year, or do I get that internship on Capitol Hill that, as a political science student, will really help me in um, figuring out if I want to do this professionally and perhaps even get my foot in the door um, for a job after college. What the internship scholarship program says is don't make that difficult choice. We will actually pay you so that you can have that really important internship. Um, the other thing to understand about career services at TCU and, our, and what we call our Center for Career and Professional Development is that once you're in the system, you're in for life. You've sort of paid. So if in 30 years you decide you know, I'd like to make a mid-career change and do something completely different, you can come back to TCU and work with one of our career specialists without having to pay for it because you've already paid along the way. You don't have to go out and spend $10,000 to hire a career coach. Again, you've already done that. So we feel really good about that as well. And then finally, just a, a comment about Fort Worth. Um, this is by itself the 13th largest city in the United, Sta United States. And then as we, we both have shared er earlier, you're part of the larger DFW metropolitan area. So students have access to anything they could find in a major city, anything from um, professional sporting events to live theater and music. Um, and what I love about TCU is we're about 10 minutes from downtown, but we're on a gorgeous residential campus 
um, that really provides students this um, idyllic setting in which to study, um, but still, again, have access to anything that you, that you could want. Um, a lot of students, and as I wrap up here, a lot of students, they sort of come into this um, learning, wanting to learn more about SMU and TCU because um, the schools on paper sound a little bit alike. Hopefully after Joe and I have spoken, you've, you're getting a sense of how different they are. When you have an opportunity to come visit campus, uh, I would encourage you to visit both campuses and you'll really see with your own eyes how the schools differ uh, quite a bit. I think, and, and Joe would probably agree with me, that SMU is a reflection in many ways of the Dallas community in which it is situated. And I think TCU in many ways is a reflection of the Fort Worth community in which it's situated. And the nice thing is, as a student at either school, you have access to two major cities. Um, so I'm going to stop there and, uh, and we can move forward with the rest of the program. Okay, thanks a lot, Heath. Um, Mom and Joe, come on back on. Let's get Joe. Great. Thanks, guys. Oh my God, I never take notes so fast in my life. You talk <laughs> faster than I do, both of you. But thank you, thank you for such you know a thorough um, presentation. Uh, so. Here are some of the questions that have come in. Um, I'll give you the ones that we got in advance and then Jason will follow up with ones that um, he's gotten as we've been on the air. Um, okay. So because this year, since you've gone completely test optional, do you think, first of all, that you're going to see more applications, perhaps more applications from Texas kids who want to stay closer to home because of pandemic. Um, and the fact that the kids who will be applying to you perhaps might not have applied before because um, their scores may not be high enough. And then further, do you think that that will see your average SAT or ACT scores go down because the kids who are submitting scores have not had much of a chance to, let's say, super score? Whoever wants it, my first guinea pig. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, a lot of questions within that question, um, and all good, all, um, all all good questions. I, I think what I, I'll start from here, which is I'm not, which is not going to answer your question, but I'll get there, uh, Judy. Um, I was on a call earlier today uh, with some other enrollment leaders, and, and one of the things that I shared about what I um, as we reflect back on what has been uh, an unprecedented. Uh, three-month period in our lives and in, in our history um, and what has been the strangest enrollment year that any of us have lived through is that as challenging as it was for seniors in high school to make their final choices, especially since many of them couldn't visit campuses, I think the year that we are about to start is going to be even more difficult because high school juniors, now seniors, so the rising seniors, will be living in a COVID environment for their entire college search. Whereas the students who are coming to us this fall only had to deal with that at the very tail end of high school. And it wasn't fun, it was difficult, and, and they had their, you know, all of those sort of rites of passages ripped out from under them. At least they could start and get a lot of a lot of the way through the journey um, before all of this transpired. I think that we're up for in for a real challenge this year. As far as the impact of going test optional goes, um, I think, and I mentioned this to you before we, we got on the air. Um, I think that the the impact of it, or sort of the projected increase that colleges usually see when they move test optional may be mitigated somewhat by the fact that almost every college is, almost every college has done that this year. Where you may see impact is schools at a, at a very highly selective level and even schools that may be in, in, a, in that sort of next rung down um, may see an increase. So we may see a slight bump. I don't think it's the bump we would have seen had we done this in isolation five years ago or, or, or 10 years ago. As for the impact on the average test score, um, I think you're going to see on the one hand, yes, students will only be taking the test maybe one time, um, or at least a certain percentage of students who in the past would have taken it multiple times may only have the chance to take it once. Um, but you're also going to see students who have scores that 
in the past would have been in the lower range for us now choose not to submit. So that will have the opposite effect. So as we've been modeling out what might happen next year, I think any uh, discrepancy will plus or minus just a few points. I don't think you're going to see a massive swing, at least at our school, um, massive swing one way or the other. I do think that we're going to see more students choose um, to pursue college locally. That was something that we had our eye on as we were making our final decisions, both in regular decision this past year and then moving on to the wait list. We were paying very close attention and looking especially at students from the DFW area and then a little bit uh, farther afield to the rest of Texas, um, knowing what the surveys were saying that the high school seniors weren't planning to, to go as far as maybe they would have um, under, under a different set of conditions. The survey data I've seen so far about the class of 21 is they are willing to look again more more broadly but all of this is going to be predicated on the ability for us to um to sort of uh to to get rid of the virus if we can't do that in the next 12 months all bets are off i agree with what heath has said i think that you know from from a from a local standpoint there's uh a couple of different things to to consider, particularly when you're talking about schools like SMU and TCU that still have residential requirements on campus and expecting students, you know, to be able to be on campus. It's um, for a student who is making a decision of I want to stay. Not only do I want to stay close to home, but I literally want to stay at home. You know. Mm -hmm. There's there's still a decision to be made about whether or not, you know, whether or not that's going to be something that's appealing for for a school like SMU or TCU when there are you know places like University of Texas at Arlington and University of Texas at Dallas that that can serve those populations. So I think that that's another factor that, that we we have to consider. Um, but I, I do think we saw um, in terms of the students who did choose to enroll, we we did see a strong interest from from the local area. We we always have a strong local group, but we saw in it what we what we saw was students that students that had the opportunity to go to very very attractive options out of state, looking much harder at those options that were closer to home because because of the uncertainty. And I think that's something that. That you know, to, to Heath's point, I think we're we're very different places, but we both benefited from from those students. Are either of you open to tours right now, either formal on campus tours limited in number, or perhaps for a family to just drive and walk on campus to get a feeling of what the school feels like? Joe, why don't yes. you take this yes. first? Okay, go go for it, Joe. <laughs> uh, so we we are yeah, I don't. You can you can see I'm I'm sitting in my office on campus right now. So we are we are slowly opening the campus at this point. Um, we we are we are open to students coming on campus, but at the same time, you know, we we want to make sure that we're doing that in a in a very safe and deliberate way. And so, you know, I the campus. If you're walking the campus right now, buildings are going to be locked. You're not. There are no students on campus. You're not going. You're not going to get a traditional feel when you're seeing the campus. That said, if 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 someone finds themselves in Dallas and drives onto the university, we are not a closed campus, and so you can get out of your car and walk around the campus, and you can see that we have the option to to do to do a walking tour and things like that. But you know, I I would. I would have a hard time encouraging a family to get on a plane and fly across the country and, and come and do a visit right now because it's it's a very different experience from what you're going to normally see and and frankly that may not be the safest thing to to do but you know in the sense that we're we're not a campus that you know we don't have gates we don't lock our gates and so it's certainly a place that you know there are with 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 just the members of the community out walking their dogs and playing with their playing with their kids and and Seeing that there's there's people on campus, but it's a very different experience than what you would normally see. I would echo what Joe said. Um, in many respects, our campus is 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 physically very similar. We don't have gates, and, and people can walk around. 
we just this week opened up or, or relaunched, I, sh I should say, our campus visit program, but in a much uh, more modified way than what would typically happen if a, if a family chose to visit. We are sending students and parents a link to our information session to watch online before they get here because we're not having live information sessions. We're trying to limit indoor activity. Um, when families register, they can come, but the tours are a little bit shorter. They are limited in size. We're to, they're maxed at 10 people. Everyone's required to wear masks. Um, on our campus, whether they're indoors or outdoors, which is frankly a, a more aggressive approach than even the local authorities are taking. Um, we have a couple of limited spots on campus that our, our tours are um, eligible to go to, um, where our tour guides have swipe access to buildings that other people aren't getting into. That's both to at least somewhat showcase a little bit of what the school looks like, but also to get people indoors because in Texas in the summer, it's 100 degrees out. So, you know, for, for that reason as well, it's, it's, it's not necessarily advisable to, to um, bring people to campus. But, you know, it's really tricky, Judy, because in order to get our campus program relaunched, that was about three, three and a half weeks worth of work. I mean, there's so much behind the scenes effort that goes into it from hiring and training tour guides who weren't planning to be here to um, getting the registration set up and sending out communication and, and putting together a schedule for our counselors and all that stuff. And so we, we started and now this week we've seen a spike in cases in Texas. And so people are going to be a little more skittish to come visit and you know, we don't want to have to go back and forth. Okay, now we're on, now we're off. But um, I think we're going to continue to take a very um, conservative approach to to this and not be offering the range of visit opportunities that we typically would. Um, and I think the enrollment manager in me is, um, is um, sleeping at night knowing that at least other schools are in the same position we are. For sure. For sure. I have one more question before I turn it over um, to Jason to let him um, ask you the questions that have just come in. Um, and recognizing that these things could change tomorrow, I'm just wondering what plans have been laid forth so far for each of you to reopen in the fall? So we have uh, every intention still to reopen in the fall. Um, it's not going to look like a traditional fall semester. There's no question about that. We have changed our calendar around a little bit. So the fall semester actually is going to start a week earlier than what was originally planned. We've also eliminated the fall break. We'll be having classes on Labor Day. We'll have two Saturday sessions as well. Um, and we'll be finished by Thanksgiving. The reason for that was twofold. One, the thought being, if we can, um, if we can try to limit the number of times students are moving on off campus and back on campus in large numbers, that could have a positive effect. And and um, that there is a theory out there that the pandemic could intensify as we get to cold, a colder season. And so if we can try to have fewer people on campus once we hit that part of the calendar, um, we could see a, a positive effect there. Um, students will have the option to take classes online though, if they are immunocompromised or they're just not comfortable being in a classroom setting, even with the social distancing uh, uh, schedule that we have in place, um, they can, from their residence hall, uh, take classes uh, online and, uh, and, and every class that's being offered uh, in person is gonna be mirrored with an online option as well. Great, okay. And Joe, SMU? I would say we're very similar. Um, the, we've made similar modifications to our schedule, no fall break, no Labor Day. We will be finishing at Thanksgiving in terms of in-person instruction here in Dallas. The expectation with no one no one returning from Thanksgiving break back to campus. Now, if a student if a student isn't able to go home for for Thanksgiving and if a student needs to be housed through the end of the semester, then we have we have accommodations in place for that. But the expectation is that most of our students would would not return to campus. The vast majority after that Thanksgiving break. Um, we will also have hybrid versions available for our classes and things like that. We actually will start, um, we, have, we have 89 students that are going to be scattered across 12 different classes 
in July, summer two, that will be the first students that are back on campus for in-person instruction. So that will be sort of our um, our test group that we're working with. Those, those, those students all volunteered to be part of that. So in the sense that we're able to sort of test with faculty and test with a smaller group of students, the, the practices we're gonna put in place with our, with our larger cohort coming in in the fall. We've, you know, looked at, you know, we have to look at everything. And so, you know, something like move-in that used to be, okay, we have a move-in day. Now all of a sudden it's eight days of move-in scattered across, you know, the, you know, more than a week to be able to maintain social distancing and be able to accommodate that and make that work the way we want it to. So, you know, every single element of, of the experience has to be looked at and has to be adjusted. And some of those decisions that are made now may end up changing if things improve or if things deteriorate, depending on what the, what the situation is by the time those dates present themselves. But we're, we're being very intentional. We're being very deliberate. And, you know, first, first priority is the health and safety of our students. And the second priority is the quality of the academic instruction. And so building from that, you know, we, we feel like we have a good, a good system in place. Yeah, I love your idea of a small cohort coming back earlier and, and testing things out finding the bugs. Anyway, thank you both. I'm going to turn this over to Jason to see what other questions have come in. Thanks, Mom. And thank you both again for being with us tonight. Uh, so I'm going to, we, I got a bunch of questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Um, let's see here. Oh, nice one. I'm sorry. My question, the questions all got messed up. All right. Uh, are your supplemental essays going to uh, going to change for the ne next admission cycle? Ours are going to remain the same. Um, we, we require two short answer uh, qu uh, responses, recommended length 100 words or fewer. Um, you know, with everything going on, our goal is to try to keep as much constant as possible. So uh, little things like that that we might otherwise uh, examine from year to year, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep the same. We have not made any changes at this point either. I would be surprised if we changed something at this late date, but at this point, we haven't made any changes. Great. Um, and Joe, um, if you want to pursue communications at SMU, uh, do you need a portfolio? And can you take classes at both Meadow and Cox? You, you can take classes both Meadows and Cox, uh, and you do not need a portfolio um, for for the communications program. So advertising, cor corporate communications, public affairs, journalism, those programs don't fall under the dual admission process like the performing arts, dance, music, theater, and art. And Heath, uh, can you take business courses at Neely and major in communications at the Bob? Uh, I can't. Uh, Bob Schieffer. Yeah. cross-registering absolutely yes our curriculum is designed for students to be able to take coursework across the disciplines even be between schools absolutely and uh can you go clarify are you test optional for international students and then what's your policy with regards to uh tofu duolingo um and any other tests we're test optional for international students as well. We certainly, um, uh, we're, we're still going to require demonstration of English proficiency. So they, so while SAT and ACT are optional, the student would still need to submit TOEFL or Duolingo um, in order to demonstrate that. Exactly the same for us as well. Right. And what percentage of international students do you expect to return and if there's a lack of students at a particular school, will, will the school allow students to petition to enter a different school and select a different major? So we have been we have been surveying our international students um, actually this week, trying to um, identify individuals that are having you know visa issues or other questions that we're going to need to address. Um, one of the one of the things that was important as we talked about our um, plan for the fall was that um, you know to Heath's point we'll have some students who may be immunocompromised or aren't comfortable being in the classroom, but we also may have some international students who aren't able to get back, 
And so wanting to be able to provide them with an opportunity to stay on track and be able to pursue their, their education online while, um, while not being able to enter the country. Or maybe they're, maybe they're able to get back, but they're not able to get here in the middle of September. So being ready to deal with that and being able to handle all of that. Um, because we, because we plan on them to be able to take classes, you know, I don't necessarily anticipate, um, significant spaces opening up within particular programs or things like that. Our international students tend to be um, distributed pretty evenly across the across the academic fields. So, you know, I don't necessarily see see any any rush to fill gaps or anything like that. But certainly, you know, that's something we're we're paying close attention to with in terms of um, enrollment for the summer and making sure that our international students understand what options are available to them and and be able to for the students who are able to get here. Um, get them taken care of, and for the students who aren't able to get here, make sure they have their options available as well. Yeah, jo Joe's response confirmed my uh, supposition, which is that this is the hot topic right now on um, in in C at senior level uh, senior levels of, of administrations. We're this is a very fluid situation with the international students. Um, yeah. We don't want it is of. Um, a highest priority that we protect them from um, having to enter a situation that that either compromises their health, but also compromises their ability to move move around, even if they get through the the visa process. And there are no guarantees there. So there's just there's so many um, question marks in the air right now that um, I really don't have a great answer for you, other than we're talking about this this week. Right. Uh, many colleges have canceled non-revenue generating sports. Have you, have either of you eliminated any sports programs for next year? And how will those cancellations impact students who are seeking athletic scholarships? We haven't canceled any sports. We have not either. Oh, great. Um, Keith, how do students uh, of different faith backgrounds blend in the university community? Oh gosh, I think in, in lots of different ways, uh, formal and, and informal. We have um, a, a wonderful university minister who. Well, let me let me take a step back because uh, if people don't know anything about the religious uh, affiliation that we have, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, I think it helps to understand um, that faith community. The Christian Church is a, is a very ecumenical faith. So, meaning they don't believe that there's necessarily one right path. And so on, it, on its face, it's sort of welcoming of everybody. Um, and so when, when you come here, you're not walking into a community where there is a tradition either in, in recent vintage or even going back to our founding where people are saying, as I said earlier, that you need to think a certain way. And so you're already in a, a what I think is a pretty comfortable environment. Uh, we have a wonderful university minister, as I mentioned, who sees it as her responsibility to um, for, for the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life to provide counsel to those who want it to, to everybody. And so, for example, we have um, Jewish students on campus and we have a Hillel on campus and we have a professional Hillel advisor paid for by the university. So um, and I use that as an example because I'm Jewish, but I think this is a um, something that would not necessarily be expected at a place called Texas Christian University, but actually, um, but we actually have a, uh, you know, a, a rather uh, diverse religious community on campus. And there's a lot of interfaith activity that's, uh, that's happening. Uh, I, I always... The Jewish population is, what percent it might be? Oh, it's pretty small. I mean, it's, it's 1%, something like that. But uh, what I say to, uh, uh, Judy and Jason Rabinovitz, I'm guessing you're Jewish. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, if you're working with you, if you're working with Jewish families, what I always say to them is, look, I don't want to. Um, I'm not going to tell you this is a place. If you're if you're a person who needs kosher dining uh, options and you want uh, to daven every day, this ain't the place for you. But if you want to come to a place where you're going to be able to connect with other Jewish people and you're not going to feel threatened in any way, there's no BDS movement on our campus at all. Um, this is a really, really comfortable place for Jewish kids to be. 
I, I, Eve, it's funny when you said you were Jewish, it reminded me of my, my children's um, school, uh, which is an Episcopalian school. They go to St. Andrews in Boca Raton, where we have a Jewish headmaster. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and the school, the, they sometimes call the school St. Mordecai or St. Moses, <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> so, do the residential commons have their own dining facilities, and what percentage of students stay in the commons during junior and senior year? Sure. Um, they do not have um, dining facilities within the commons themselves. So we have two main dining halls, um, one one situated sort of within a cluster of five of the commons in the south end of campus, and then one closer to the north end of campus where the, where the other group of commons are. So there's two main dining halls that are part of that. Um, we have about, it's about thir 30, 30% of our upper class juniors and seniors who are living on campus, but that includes students who are living on campus in housing that we have beyond the residential commons as well. So we have some upper class housing that are not part of the commons. And so we have, frankly, we have more students who want to live in the commons then we have space within the commons to fill them. So we accommodate as many of those juniors and seniors as we can and then and then work from there to make sure that they have a space on campus if they want it. I really like to thank you both. I, I've kept you long enough and uh, we've, we've covered virtually every question that uh, was asked tonight. Um, and so again, thank you both for coming, uh, for being with us tonight. Just want to let the crowd know we have some more webinars uh, next week, next month. We are starting a new webinar series. It's going to be hosted by another one of our educational consultants, Kathy Hart. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting FRAC, which is the Florida Regional uh, Admissions Counselors, uh, College Counselors, uh, the, the, the regional readers and admissions from, uh, I think there's about 20 to 30 colleges uh, across the country. Uh, each week, we're going to be covering a different topic. Uh, there's a list of the topics here. If you go to scorewebinar.com, uh, you, you can sign up for all of these at once. Uh, real fast. And if you go to scorewebinars.com, you can see the links to all of our previous recordings. Again, thank you both for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks to our audience for being part of this webinar. Thank you so much. Um, stay well. And I hope to be walking on your campuses soon. <laughs> thanks for having us. Thank you. thank you, Judy. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Stay healthy, everybody. Good night.